You had a quote that I really liked, and, and, and it, you said, I'm just trying to write good songs, and if people like them, then I'm happy. If they don't, well, that's all right, too. Songwriting is just as much for the writer as it is for the listener. Sure. I said that? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Every once good? in a while, I say something smart. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Uh, songwriting is a very personal thing, and uh, you can't pay too much attention to what other people think about it. If they like it, that's cool. Mm. I mean, if they like it, then you're in business, you mm -hmm. know? If they don't, you just you keep going and you find your audience somewhere. You know? Yeah, yeah. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. Oh, salute, amigo. Salute, man. Cheers. I'm actually from East Texas myself. I saw that. So you're from Van uh, Myrtle Springs. Yeah, yeah. It's right next to Canton over in Van Zandt County. I was always confused by that. Like, is Towns, yeah, does that have anything to do with Towns Van Zandt or not? Uh, so his family, that county is named after his family. Okay. His family is a, is, is a wealthy kind of well-known Fort Worth family. That's I been see. around for generations. I see. Yeah. Okay, so you're you're born born and raised in Louisiana. No, no, no. I was born in uh, East Texas. So born in East Texas, yeah, yeah. moved but to Louisiana. My, my family is my mom's side of the family is from Louisiana. I see. Yeah, I got you. Tell me this: like, how do you get to Fort Worth, Texas? What is it that took you to Fort Worth? Well, we kind of, you know, I was always I, I consider East Texas my my kind of home, you know. But we were always moving all around North Texas when I was growing up, and. Uh, I spent most of my life over there growing up in East Texas, but uh, my mom moved us to Dallas at one point. She moved us to this little suburban towns around, you know, and uh, I I don't know how the hell I ended up in Fort Worth, but I'm glad I did, man. Yeah, I love this town, man. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. And I lived in Dallas for a little bit and damn near went crazy. Like, it's just too much concrete for a person like me. I need, yeah, I need to be out. And um I don't know. Fort Worth just has a very cool vibe to it. Yeah, it's a it's a small town within a big city. You yeah, know? that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, um, man, you got a you got a lot of stuff going on right now. You know, you you released Fried Chicken and Evil Women back in nineteen. Yeah, I think you, so. You got a new one coming out um, that Rodney Crow is producing, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to get into all of that. Like, I, I dang sure want to dive deep into that. But uh, before we do, like, how's life treating you? right now man it, you know i'm glad to be alive i'm glad to be uh around my family every day so yeah you know i just had a, a baby not too long ago he's about four and a half months old congratulations yeah thank you brother so things ain't too bad considering everything that's going on you know yeah 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 i noticed you're playing some live shows coming up here pretty we're soon slowly too. trickling back in man back yeah. into the live music system yeah <laughs> <laughs> So tell me this, I, I'll back up. Like I want to go back to when you first picked up the guitar. What were you, 18 years old? Somewhere like 18, 17, yeah. How did that even come into your existence? I just liked music at the time when I was a teenager and I didn't have a lot of friends, you know, moving around constantly uh, in my later teenage years. Uh, so music was kind of, you know, just became my, my outlet for creativity, you know. Was anybody in your family, were they playing music? No. Okay. Besides, you know, my papa played cassettes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Old Elvis Presley, you know, CDs and stuff. When he passed away, I inherited his record collection. It was pretty extensive as well. Pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you find this guitar. Like, how do you, how do you learn this, this, uh, 
instrument? Are you self-taught or do you have a mentor I actually, at that time? So I think, uh, you know, a lot of folks will learn off the internet, YouTube and stuff. I had this, uh, uh, my sister had a buddy who liked to drink a lot and <laughs> other, among other things, but uh, I would buy him like a 40 of whatever malt liquor and he taught me how to play the basic chords. It's a guy named Dustin. Dustin, if you're watching, what's up, buddy? <laughs> Beer for lessons. <clears throat> Pretty much, yeah. So I learned how to play a G chord, C chord, D chord, and then I was already writing short stories and poetry at the time, so I kind of, it just came natural to try to start writing immediately. So I uh -huh. think, I don't think I learned any covers. I took those three chords and came up with my own song right away. Yeah. So I've been songwriting not bad. You kind of yeah. went the John Prine route, right? Like. Yeah, I mean, the song wasn't any good. <laughs> yeah but yeah so tell me about that because most songwriters or at least like the if I, uh, what, what you just said reminded me of like a guy clark you know getting into poetry and writing and that stems from his family sitting around at, at the dinner table like reading poetry to each other like was that a thing is that what got you into that no nah, not many man. 18 year olds like or at least where i'm from like reading poetry you know yeah I mean? well I, I took it the weird route because uh, at the time i was doing a lot of uh psychedelic drugs Oh yeah, and I was getting my hands on you know, DMT and LSD and, and mushrooms, and but I, I was getting into uh, the Doors, you know, the band, the Doors, yeah. and I was kind of reading this Jim Morrison biography or autobiography, I think, and uh, he was kind of a drunk poet, and that kind of attracted me, you know. So that's how I got into trying to write poetry. <laughs> I'd be curious to see some of those writings when it, oh, you they're know, so on LSD. Bad, man. And... So bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I would. I... So I'm curious to know. Like, I'll go down that road. Like, I'll take the. I'll. I'll take the bait on that one. Like, psychedelics is something that I got into about I don't know two years or so ago. Really. And really, it's a game changer. I mean, honestly, if we're being honest, I'm microdosing right now. Are you really on yeah. what? Yeah. Um, uh, LSD. No, psilocybin. Psilocybin. I got yeah, you. but it's so like it's no trip right that's why you're so happy all the time that <laughs> <laughs> it has a lot to do with it you know but it really just changes your perception and yeah. that is our reality you know it just how you view the world and what lens you're looking through and so yeah it did like that that changed how i saw things and it expanded you know in in human reality we are we're very limited with these five senses and what i think a psychedelic does is it broadens that that lens yeah, man, I think it can, if you use it correctly, use it as a tool, it can be uh, eye-opening, can change your perspective on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time I was doing it, we were doing it to get fucked up, you yeah. know, and yeah. nobody was really thinking about the uh, the psychoactive positive properties of, sure. you know, dialmethyltryptamine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, but... <clears throat> Yeah, man, it opened up my eyes in a few ways because once I did figure out that you can use it that way, uh, I learned a thing or two. Yeah, I think, you know, it is. It's set and setting, right? Like, how are you yeah. doing it? And it got a bad rap. Psychedelics got a bad rap back in the 70s um, because of that, you know. But there's organizations now like MAPS and um, uh, Johns Hopkins are doing studies now to show the benefits for mental health, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, there's plenty of information. If anybody wants to go check that stuff out, it's really interesting. Um, but moving forward, so you come out, or you've been, so, you, okay, let's, let's back up. You, you're playing, you start playing the guitar and you start going and, and playing, um, you paid your dues, right? In, in, in Fort Worth and in these bars and barbecue joints and anywhere yeah. you could play, I would assume. Yeah. Are you playing originals? Or are you playing Man, some I covers was trying at that to time? Do, I was trying to do mostly originals, but you know, when you're playing a three hour gig, at a barbecue joint somewhere, you know, and uh, you kind of have to try to... I did a lot of covers, but it was covers that I wanted to play. So that kind of got me in some trouble with a few different venues because they wanted... Some people want, you know, what's on the radio or they want something that's recognizable that people will be like, oh, I know that song. Yeah. But I was playing like Lightning Hopkins songs and shit. Like, <laughs> nobody knows who the fuck Lightning Hopkins is. That's a shame, but... Yeah. But yeah, man. They wanted to hear more David Allen Coe? I guess. <laughs> you, I'm so... Are you tired of hearing that yet? No, I'm, I regret writing that lyric because I get it at every single show. And now it's every interview. 
I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring it up, my friend. Mm-hmm. But damn good song if you want to catch the reference. Thank you, man. Yeah, if you want that, to catch that the... song, almost didn't make it on the record actually. Really? Yeah, and uh, my manager Travis, he uh, thought it was one of the best songs that I've written, and he kind of convinced me to put it on, keep it on the record. Yeah, I'm glad you did. Yeah. Matter of fact, they almost couldn't get your name on this marquee. So I believe it. <laughs> I believe that M's kind of crowded at, towards the end. There. Yeah. <laughs> um. So you've toured around with some some pretty big names, right? Um, Turnpike Troubadours. Yeah, 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 those are good boys. Um, mm-hmm. Charlie Crockett, Mr. Coulter Wall. Um, I'm curious to know, like, how is that experience? What do you learn from those guys? What do they learn from you? What is that like touring? And we'll, and, and I'll narrow it down. We'll go with Coulter because that seems like the most recent. Like, what is it like touring with the Coulter Wall? Man, that kind of changed my life, uh, changed my world. Uh, I don't know if he's learned anything from me, <laughs> per se, but he uh, he kind of, him and his camp, man, they took me under their wing, and Coulter kind of, I, I credit him to a lot of the, uh, whatever minor success I'm having with opportunities that are coming my way right now. Him and Charlie Crockett and Turnpike as well, those dudes. But Coulter kind of, he took, he was the first guy to take me on longer tours and uh it were some, there were some pretty big venues for me yeah uh and i'm sure for him too uh but i'd never played in front of that many people before so it was kind of a trip man you know we yeah. used to playing uh small little dive bars and shit and then you go from that to selling out like the portland i don't know somewhere in portland oregon i think it's the crystal ballroom shit was crazy <laughs> so did you open and he's headlining yeah i uh, wouldn't be on any other way man <laughs> yeah yeah well i didn't know if there were any other acts or if there was anybody else on the bill yeah no all the all the shows i did with him he was i was just supporting him yeah yeah i got you man i had him on the show back in december and i can't say enough good things about him i mean um just a fucking solid human being from he what is, i could tell yeah. you know yeah. and talented is an understatement um, mm-hmm. to be as young as he is and do what he's doing it's uh, it's inspiring and, and humbling you know to see somebody uh react to the success that he's having you yeah know? i think he just turned 17. <laughs> <laughs> Man. yeah I, I, he's he's my favorite songwriter you know, yeah writing songs these days uh he's the best one of the best out there man for sure yeah yeah, and is touted by what Steve Earle, Rick Rubin as one of the best, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so tell me this. Um, I, I found out after he came on the show, I didn't realize he turned down Rogan. He turned down the Joe Rogan Who? podcast. Coulter did. No, who's Joe Rogan? <laughs> Man, I love that, dude. Yeah. It's just a thing like anything else, you know. It's, it's, it's funny that it's been made so public and that Joe Rogan keeps kind of prodding at it you know yeah it's almost like fuck you man why are you coming on my show <laughs> but you know and any other place like well, i guess he's got a platform to put that out there but if there's a music venue out there they're not gonna like put on their marquee why doesn't cult to come play you know right right it's funny man <clears throat> so if you get the call from rogan are you going sure yeah. i'm more open to things you know i, I think Coulter, uh he he's he doesn't really care about uh, what other people think or trying to please other people. He's kind of yeah. in his own world, which is why I love him so much. Yeah. But, you know, I, I'd go in a heartbeat. Why not, man? Yeah. And I, and I think you're right. Like, that's what's resonating right now is staying authentic, staying true to who whoever it is that you are, you know. And then to me, what I found um, is, like, people are going to line up with you and, and back up, you know, back that up. Not yeah. everybody. Some won't get in line, and that's fine, but that's not your people, you know? Yeah, yeah. Along those lines, um, when we're talking about songwriting and music and art, um, how do you separate that, man? Like, how do you write as an artist, as a musician? How are you writing and not trying to follow a trend or, or chase money or, or expectations that others may put on you? Shit, dude. I think, you know, I started out trying to play classic country in Texas, you know, like, there's not a whole lot of people these days that really like that kind of thing, you know, I think people, and it's just the natural progression of the genre of music, you know, a lot of people, uh, when you hear Texas country, you think of, 
insert like some of the newer guys that are doing it. You know, they're not. There's not a whole lot of folks. I think the game changer was Charlie Crockett for a lot of people. He started playing all these these old classic country tunes, and it kind of opened people's eyes up a little bit. But what was the question? I'm sorry, I got started rambling. Well, I was asking like, how do you separate the art from the business side of it? Like, how do you not chase the trends of of um, you know? Okay, if I write this or an, an expectation that somebody may have of you um, to chase the dollar, I guess, to chase the carrot versus saying, no, this is what I am. Like, I'm going to write what's true to me. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I haven't, haven't really crossed that bridge yet because I'm not really well known. So I don't have any demand on me to do a certain thing. I mean, there may be a small group of people that will get pissed off if I, if I put out like a rock and roll record one mm -hmm. day. But I think... Uh, at this point, man, I'm just lucky to be uh, able to do whatever I want to do. Yeah. So I haven't really paid much attention to that, you know. Yeah, I got you. You had a quote that I really liked, and, it, and it, it, you said, I'm just trying to write good songs, and if people like them, then I'm happy. If they don't, well, that's all right, too. Songwriting is just as much for the writer as it is for the listener. Sure. I said that? Yeah. Man, <laughs> every good? once in a while I say something smart. <laughs> yeah. For sure, uh, songwriting is a very personal thing, and uh, you can't pay too much attention to what other people think about it. If they like it, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they like it, then you're in business, you mm -hmm. know? If they don't, you just you keep going and you find your audience somewhere. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that applies to life in general, right? Like, there is that element of commerce. There is that element of money, making money, um, in, in what you do in the living. And I think whenever that passion aligns with what other people value, well, then you fucking win. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like a Coulter wall. Like when you do it, he's done and it lines up and people see value in it. Like you win, you know? And so I think, and I'll just speak for myself. Like, I think I had it backwards at one time. Like I was chasing the money and the, what I love to do kind of took a back seat. Well, you, you know? know, I think, uh, me personally, man, there was one point where I was chasing the money as well. I was playing a lot of like three hour gigs and I was piling them on them and doing as many as I could because I was trying to put food on the table and I was scared for like what was going to come next. You yeah. Know? Wasn't sure. So I think uh, desperation drives people sometimes. And that's yeah. okay. Sometimes you got to learn that way, you know? Yeah. Well, you got to do what you got to do to get through, right? Yeah. But uh, there is something to be said for doing something and going into something with the eye with uh you know the knowledge that it might not work out yeah take me back to that place though like early on in your career and you're still young right like you're still in your 20s I'm i believe 28 now i'm getting older man <laughs> <laughs> you're still a spring chicken my friend I'm, but like early on like those obstacles come up challenges come up i'm sure self-doubt and i'm not projecting that on you but i'm curious to know if it did like how do you overcome that self-doubt yeah like well, am i doing the right thing um fuck, i'm spending three hours i'm getting home at two or three in the morning like that thought has never crossed my mind i'll be honest with you man uh i my whole adult life is i've been spent you know has been spent doing this so yeah it's never, and I never really had any family or a girlfriend or any anybody who told me, like, you're fucking up. Why are you doing this? It's just a waste of time. I did have one girlfriend earlier on in my career who was kind of skeptical about some things. But, I mean, those people quickly exit. That's the reason why she's your ex-girlfriend? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I, I was lucky. I've been very lucky uh, in my life to have people that are supportive. Yeah. Even when things are really uncertain. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. I, I mean, I think that's uh, that's crucial. Like who we surround ourselves, what our environment is. You know, that that's totally, what creates our reality. Um, do you have like a like a favorite? What I would call like a favorite failure or a perceived failure at a, at a certain time. Looking back, like that had to happen to set you up for a later success. Yeah, there's a couple that I probably shouldn't talk about on <laughs> on camera, but. Yeah, there's been points to where I I got my hopes up with certain things and they really didn't work out, man. And I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? 
And then that can yeah, it's funny that you guys ask good questions, man. I like you already, dude. Uh, Thank you. I think I'll take the compliment. Yeah, but hey, cheers, by the way. So, well, let I'll me cheers get the, you with your get coffee. The adult I don't care. Beverage. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I've had a few moments like that where, but things, certain, sometimes things work out. I've also had moments where it didn't work out and I'm still like, fuck, that sucks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what can you do? Well, you never know, like, and that's something I think about a lot. I meditate, I journal about it. Like, how do you know? Like, in the in the moment, you're sitting here asking, "Why is this happening? I don't understand." But you look back three years from now, and you're, "Oh, that what I thought was bad was actually fucking good. Like, that had to yeah. happen." Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can trace a lot of things back in my life, and everything's kind of connected. Yeah. You know? It's trippy when you start thinking about all that stuff, you know. I try not to think about it too much. Yeah, it's like the butterfly effect, right? Yeah. One little thing can shift shift the future. And I try to think about that like in the now, in the present moment, like shit that comes up that's out of my control. I try to view it all as good, like it's supposed it is supposed to happen. And I genuinely believe that, you know, and, and again that's a mindset that we can choose. It's a perception that we definitely have the ability to choose. And so I feel like when you look for the good, it's a lot easier to find. For sure, you know? man. Yeah, yeah. If you if you surround yourself with positivity, I think that that's what matters. Yeah, makes a difference. Yeah. Um, give me give me a funny story. Like uh, I, I saw it was an interview or something you were doing, and it was some lady fucking with your gear on stage, and uh, I think your reference to her was just because just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's such a great rule of thumb to live by. <laughs> <man>. I know. <clears throat> Again, sometimes I say smart things. <laughs> yeah. Not very often. Yeah. Yeah, I think that lady was trying to dance on stage while I was playing, and uh, she had like a group group of people with her, her her boyfriend and some other a couple another uh, two couples, and uh, she just was it was like a small burger joint with a very small stage with a staircase that you could it's like you know five feet tall, and she decided she was going to get up and dance, and this is me solo acoustic on stage and she got up there and started dancing I'm, I'm cool with that you know i could i'll finish the song and be like hey do you mind stepping off but she was grabbing the microphone <laughs> mid song like mid sentence i was trying like to sing you know, karaoke or something yeah and uh i just told her I was like you know just because you can doesn't mean you should but she she took that i don't know how she in her mind she thought i was calling her fat at one point <laughs> because she was she was like Okay, I'm getting off the stage. And then her boyfriend started laughing. Everybody was laughing at her. Then she got embarrassed. I felt bad, man. I was like, I was planning on getting down and talking to her and, and, and telling her, hey, I didn't mean to embarrass you, but yeah, you can't get on stage. <laughs> but her boyfriend ended up, he went from laughing to trying to fight me. Oh, shit. There's been so many instances like that when you play shows, when I've played shows, uh, especially at those smaller places because you're, you're right there with with whoever's listening yeah uh, how, how many reps do you think you have right now like how many shows do you think you played at this point i don't know thousands i don't know maybe i don't know about thousands probably maybe like seven seven thousand just seven just seven <laughs> yeah i'm getting started i'm not real sure i never thought about that before uh i'm sure it's a couple thousand maybe yeah, and I'm just curious, like the reason I asked that, it's like every musician I've sat down with, I'm so humbled and inspired because of the reps you guys have to put in, you know, like the grind. Um, I think it was William Clark Green that got some advice from Wade Bow, and he's like, man, you got to dedicate 10 years of, of your life to this thing and really not know if it's going to work out. Yeah. And so I envy you guys in a way because it's like, this is your calling. Like you said, this is, I, I haven't thought about doing anything else. But at the same time, that doesn't mean, just because I envy you, doesn't mean it's easy in any way. You know, like you have definitely put your reps in. And uh, I think there was one show I was watching. The, the bar room was very loud. It was very, you know, everybody's Sounds screaming. like one of my shows. But when you started playing, it like, everything got quiet. And I thought that was so powerful, man. It kind of gave me chills, you know. To, yeah, was that the the White Horse gig somewhere in the video? I think so. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, I couldn't. I posted a video of me playing the White Horse recently. That might have been it. But, yeah, that's happened a few times, man. And it's really cool when it does because, you know, you're doing your job right. If you can make people shut up for a minute and yeah. listen. But if they don't, that's okay, too. What is your – I'm curious to know about your mindset. Um, on stage, 
for sure. But then, like, before you go on, like, the day of, it's like game day. You know, I played college baseball, and so I relate everything to sports. And, like, game day was a big deal, like, getting your mind right, and especially, like, pregame. What is it like for you guys, or for you as a musician, going into a show? Well, I try not to think about I try to ignore the fact that I'm about to go on stage until, like, I'm stepping on the stage. Yeah. I try not to think about it too much because I think early on, some of the first bigger gigs that I had open enough for people, I got really in my head about things. and it's You're just going to play. It's, it's no different from going to play a show for five people than it is for, you know, 6,000 people or 2,000 people. <clears throat> a thousand people is probably pretty more, pretty, a little more accurate, but, uh, yeah, man, I just kind of, I try to, I try to ignore the fact that I'm about to go on stage. So there's no pregame ritual, no pregame drink, no oh, pregame warm-up. Or... Pregame rituals that have come and gone for me, you know, I used to drink, I, when I was on the road with Coulter, I used to, uh, Try to get as drunk as I could 30 minutes before I went on stage. <laughs> just because you know, I had to, man. It was crazy. <clears throat> was that those... nerves? Why was that? Yeah, it was nerves. You know, when you get on stage uh, in front of a sold-out venue and wherever the hell, uh, it, it you know, it's nerve-wracking, man. It yeah. is. Yeah. So alcohol helped a little bit. But these days I try to stay sober and, and really try. I've been trying to fight through that anxiety of getting on the stage in front of people, you know? Yeah. Because it's, it's not a long-term solution to turn to alcohol to help you. Yeah. As I'm drinking a beer. <laughs> yeah, but tell me this, like, have you ever had, what, give me an embarrassing moment that you've had on stage. I don't want to, man. <laughs> oh, you, gotta, you, can't, you can't tease it like that. I got a couple, I mean, uh, there was one where uh, I was playing, and I shouldn't be telling this story. I'm going to regret saying this, but uh, I was playing in Arkansas with Coulter, and uh, I think he was playing this Norman Blake song called Randall Collins, and I had been playing it for a few years at that point, but he busted it out, <clears throat> I think maybe as his encore, part of his encore, and uh, I was like, oh, I know that song, and I was drunk, and this is after I played, so I'm like, hey, man, he won't give a shit if I get up there and try to sing with him. So I walk on stage and I step up to the microphone and he turns around and he's like, oh, cool. And he starts singing, but he sings a different version of it. Uh. So we were singing different lines and I, was, I fucked the whole song up, man. And I felt so bad and I was embarrassed. He stopped the whole song and he looked, he's like, who the hell is this drunk asshole on stage? Oh, fuck. He was joking with me. He was trying to turn it around and make it a funny thing but it was hilarious <laughs> it was a, a great failure yeah that's nothing bad man I nah mean, that shit happened right i mean <clears throat> somebody threw a bra on stage on that tour and i put it on and got on stage in front of a lot of people and <laughs> walking around well so tell me that like whenever y'all are touring around is it, are you on a bus are you in a sprinter what do you what are you guys traveling in? <clears throat> so we were in a a couple of different vehicles, but we mainly traveled in a, uh, like a 90s Chevy van, you know, Hell and Col yeah. Coulter's got his rig with the trailer and everything, but we were, we were rolling with a, a van with a U-Haul trailer for most of those. I think at one point we were in a, a Ford pickup truck, a couple, you know, it had, a, it was a, a dual cab, I think, but. Staying in the van or staying in hotels? Hotels. I got you. But I've done my fair share of sleeping in, in vans and, and uh, trucks. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I want to get into some in, into uh, some songwriting stuff, as I do with every musician that comes on. Um, but I want to kind of hang on this for a little bit with you. Um, what are some things that you're doing, like um, exercises, practices, um, whenever you're sitting down to write a song? Uh, you know, I don't really have any exercises or practices that I do when I go to write um, I try to you know sometimes it's just it really is like a different process every time I try to write a song I try different things all the time so I don't really have a, like a certain set way that I do it you know but I think most of the time I'll sit down and just kind of try to catch things that are in the air you know try to catch whatever's floating by me and and 
record it, you know, write it down and come up with a melody. Yeah. Because I think some of the, well, the best songs that I've written have been, you know, spontaneous or, you know, written really quickly. Yeah. Like, uh, what was it? Um, Fried Chicken and Evil Women. You wrote that in 30 minutes? Something like that, yeah. Where were you? Like, where are you at when that song was written? I don't know. I think I was, uh, I have no clue, man. I don't remember. I got you. Um, so is that something like, because I'm so curious as to this, like, um, are you sitting down in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, or is it literally like you're just, as these ideas come to you, and that seems to be the consistent trend, right? The ideas just kind of float out of nowhere. Yeah, well, I think um, the important thing that, uh, you know, is not to force anything. Okay. Because if you spend too long thinking about something, you'll overthink it. And it, 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 it's kind of a sign for me. If I spend more than like a day or two working on a song, it's usually, it usually turns out to be a bad song. Mm. You know, for me, because you can work it. I think everybody has a different process, but for me, I've found that that works the best, you know. Yeah. So that's, it's interesting, you know, as I've sat down with more musicians, I've questioned that in my own life, you know, as an entrepreneur, I question like what is productive use of my time versus non-productive use. And it, it seems like what I once thought was non-productive potentially could be productive. Like I could have some good shit float through my head, you know, Oh yeah. um, like Elizabeth Cook, she talked about, um, in her interview, like she can be washing the dishes and just an idea floats by. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta grab them when they float by, man. And, that, and that's something I took from Cor Blund. He says uh, like his antenna is always up. Right? I believe that with that fellow, man. <laughs> and so you know him. He's amazing. He, yeah, I, I played one show with him at the Bluebird Cafe in uh, Nashville. Nashville yeah. Him and Coulter and Brandy Clark, we did this, a song swap. And that guy, he really is uh, sharp as a tack. Yeah. 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 I I loved having him on and uh but that but that stuck with me, you know, it's like keep your antenna up, you know, and um I fuck around with writing on a very amateur level, but I enjoy it, you know, it's just kinda like an outlet. I do a lot of journaling and yeah and, and stuff like that and uh and so uh, it, it did. It it raised my awareness um as to keeping my antenna up just in any any situation. It makes me more observant. I observe things more you know i may see them in a different way um tell me this like in your opinion what is it that makes a good songwriter or a good storyteller i don't know if i'm qualified to answer that but i think uh my favorite stuff uh is a mixture of <clears throat> the uh you know the history of music i like uh a lot of folk music and i like a lot of uh old blues songs and stuff like that and I, I like songwriters that pay respect to the past as far as like the music the actual music side of things but <clears throat> with songwriting uh i like people like john prine <clears throat> that can mix comedy and tragedy together you mm -hmm. know and and kind of not take themselves too seriously when they need to and take themselves seriously when they need to but uh i think uh that's a that's a hell of a question, man. I could go on and on about about that, but how do you find that balance, though? How do you find the balance between the comedy and the tragedy? I think you should be honest with yourself and honest with uh, whatever you're doing. Yeah, you know, if you're sad, if you're, it, it goes back to like not trying to force anything. Because mm -hmm. if you have somebody expecting you to write a funny record or something goofy like uh, with a title like Fried Chicken and Evil Women. You know, but you don't feel like that. You've changed. You know, you can't, you can't force it. Yeah, you can't fake the funk, as they say. You know. Yeah, I love it. But this this record that I've got coming out, man, it's really sad, and uh, yeah, it's somber. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. So, um, Rodney Crowell is producing it. How do you get hooked up with a name like that? Like, how does how does that? How do you cross paths with him? Uh man, I'm still not sure how it happened, dude. He, uh, I was recording, I was writing these songs and sending them to my manager. Uh, right whenever shit was really hitting the fan with coronavirus and right. everything, you know, I was. Uh, I wrote a couple, couple of these songs and I recorded them in my shed in my backyard, 
and uh, sent them to my manager, and he was kind of taken back. He's like, whoa, this shit, this shit's serious, man. Let me send this to some people. And he kind of uh, sent it to some folks. He ended up in uh, the hands of David Macias from 30 Tigers, and I think uh, old David uh, liked it, and he was it, the wheels were turning for him, and he uh, somehow got sent to Rodney, and Rodney liked it and gave me a call, and we started talking about production and stuff. And our our views for the songs that I sent him kind of lined up, so it yeah. made a lot of sense. Yeah. And he's kind of, he's uh, in that same vein, you know, uh, with, with uh, Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt, the great Texas folk singers and songwriters, you know. Yeah, I mean, he was right there with those guys. Um, you know, watching those old Heartworn Highway videos. Yeah. Um, I always wondered, uh, I forget what, so I think it was maybe the mercenary song that Steve Earl sang, but they were all sitting around the table, you know, and I'd watch those over and over. And uh, I was always like, who's the girl in the flowered shirt, like across from Steve Earl? Like, I never could figure it out. Well, it was fucking Rodney Crow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the girl. <laughs> But um, yeah, man. I mean, uh, just one of the one of the greats that uh, that has ever been, and and to be in Nashville, I'm just curious, like, how was it to work with him? What were some, like, can you share with listeners, like, any golden nuggets that that um, he may have shared with you? Oh, he had so many little bits of wisdom that he imparted on me during that process. But uh, and that can be from like a mindset standpoint. That can be from songwriting to playing to anything. I'm just yeah. He kind of he was really picky about it was like he questioned a lot of things in my songwriting which was good for me i didn't really end up changing a whole lot but he was suggesting like certain rhymes like hey man try that word here you know he wasn't really it wasn't like a co-writing thing but he suggested a few things but really man uh he invited me to his house uh for dinner with his wife and a fella uh, i can't remember his name but he he wrote he's a songwriter for the eagles uh and that was a trip, but we sat and talked and drank some wine, and his wife cooked for us. And uh, he kind of he had a lot of wisdom uh, to give me, you know. He's kind of I felt like a mentor vibe the whole time, yeah. And he was supportive, and uh, he was uh, complimenting of my songwriting, which that's it means the world to me coming from him. So you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah, man. That and yeah, that is. Uh... That's something that I strive to do. Like I strive to surround myself with people like a Rodney Crowd or like, um, and what I mean by that is like people that have been there, done it, proven themselves because it's in the details, right? Like what separates the greats from the goods? It's the details, those little things, like he's suggesting those little words or whatever that you pick up along the way. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, cause like in the beginning, like any beginning of anything, I feel like the growth is like this. And then at some point, it's going to kind of play out, and it's going to be very incremental, and then it becomes a long game. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, you hit your plateau at some point, I guess. Yeah, I don't want to say plateau, because I feel like you can always keep growing as long as we're That's trying. That's true, yeah. But I just feel like you're going to get to a level, like, where you're at, and, um, like, it's just in the details. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't mean to project that on you in any way. I just feel like, in general, you know... Um, as a professional, like you're gonna get any professional baseball player, football player, they're not gonna go from running a four five forty to a three nine. You know what I mean? Yeah. They may get to a four four, but it's just like incremental growth. And um, like I said, I think it's the long game. It's delayed gratification. And and um, as a as a musician and the guys that I've sat down with, I think that's that is uh, a necessity. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's been survival for me, you know. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, this whole thing, man. It's just uh, I started out music as a as a means of survival, as a means to try to pay my rent and and make it. But you know, I think I I picked a good route to try to do that. I picked a good tool. I think. Yeah. Um, has it ever felt like a job? Yeah, when when I was playing, I think I did. We d went down to Houston and did a, a show somewhere, and we were playing like uh, two, three hour sets back to back with like a thirty minute break in between. It felt like work, you know. Some things feel like work. Driving for ten hours straight by yourself, you know, to try to get to a session on time or get to a show on time that that feels like work. Yeah. But you know, it's just things that you got to do to get through. So. Yeah. 
when you talk about sessions, are you talking about like in Nashville? Going yeah, I, I, I drove up by myself to the uh, to my recording session with Rodney for this record we're about to put out. So tell me that. So I don't know anything about the music business. Are you in the studio with him for days? Are you are you going in for a day and then coming back in a week? Or like, how does it work? Well, I think uh, with. Uh, in the times we're in, and just to kind of, uh, with Corona and everything, we had to plan it out where I could get in and out. So we did three days in the studio and then a day to go over things and mix everything. But uh, we record everything live, so, you know. But I came a week early, and I stayed in Kentucky uh, at this uh, old, sort of like a, a boarding house kind of place with it's like a little motel but it's like an old house somebody converted to a motel but and i stayed there for a week to quarantine uh, and then uh i chilled for a little while after and came back i got you yeah i got you um if you have any advice for like a young songwriter that may be out there just getting started um what advice do you do you give to those guys I don't feel qualified to give anybody advice, but I will say, you know, uh, try not to take yourself too seriously. You know, I think uh, that's important because once you get caught up with in your ego, you know, I think that's when things go downhill for people. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I didn't come from a whole lot when I started doing this, so anything that happens to me that's good is, you know, is a blessing. So I think... Don't take yourself too seriously and try to remember that this shit is a blessing, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I, I think that's very sage advice. Um, I have to remind myself of that all the time, you know? Yeah, everybody does, man. Uh, that's just life, you know? Yeah. I think it's a lot of it's social conditioning. Like, we think we have to be grown up at some point and have to go to work or have to... It has to be a struggle. You know, we have to... Yeah. I think we've, or at least for me, I've been taught, like, you got to struggle for it to be worth... And yeah, I get it. Like, yes, it's hard work, but again, matter of perception, like, I try. I have on my board in my office, like, play. And I can remember to fucking play, you know? Like, do you play guitar? Do you, do you uh, write songs as well? I try... Like, I, again, very amateur. Um, I've been playing the same fucking three chords since I was in college, you know, and that's so, all you need, man. <laughs> I would love to get better. And, and so I was talking with, uh, Daniel Donato. Do you know him out of Nashville? I just met that guy over the internet not too long ago. He reached out to me. He's, he seems like a really sweet guy. Fucking great dude, man. Yeah. Just from what little interaction we had, he, he was on the show last week, but seems like a great guy, but sh shreds on the guitar. Oh yeah, you know? dude. But, um. Yeah, I would love to sit down and like learn from like a Vincent L. Emerson or like a Daniel Donato. Any any of you guys that are doing it professionally. Um, Shit, I think but, Daniel Donato is a little more qualified to teach you. Well, guitar yeah, wise. He, he and that may be true, but like where I'm at, he may be over. Hell, all of y'all are overqualified. You know what I mean? Like for where <laughs> I'm at. Um, but uh, well, yeah, thanks, so I man. try. I appreciate like, that. Yeah, man, I uh, I pick around a little bit, but yeah, I do. I watch you guys, like you and a Coulter, and I'm just like mind blown. You Culture know? blows my mind all the time, man. Mind Anytime blowing. he puts out a record, it is mind blowing. <clears throat> I appreciate that compliment, man. You know, uh, you learn a lot from anybody that comes across you in your life. That you know, that's such a broad statement, but it's true, man. But it's very true. Yeah. Like, no, I agree with you one hundred percent. You know, are you aware enough to see it though? Yeah. 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 You got to look out. Yeah. That's why I'm curious to know about the practices that you're doing or the exercises. Um, so I'll ask that. Ah, I see why you're asking those questions. Oh yeah, now. dude, the, this show is to scratch my own itch, right? Like, oh, yeah. this, I, I have people on that I'm genuinely interested in, and I ask the questions I'm genu genuinely want to know the answer to, and so it's like. I think that's a secret to your uh, success with the with these interviews, man, because you're you are genuinely interested and in, yeah. In that, well, answers. thank you. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, it's like, uh, well, who better to ask than these guys that are that I respect and, and yeah. listen to their music. And so, um, yeah. So what is your advice to me? Like, like, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to sit here and give me a guitar lesson, but like if I were to work on one thing, what would that be? Uh, you know, I think people get really caught up in the idea that this thing that, that we do as musicians at whatever level of success that people have. So take someone like Colt DeWall for, example you know or uh daniel donato and with his guitar playing and his songwriting 
a lot of people think they look at these people and they say, "Man, that shit's really good." Like I'll never be able to do that. Mm. I mean, what if Coulter told himself that when he started? You know, that just kind of I don't know what if he might have. I don't know, but and I did when I first started. But once I got over that, I was like, "Man, anybody can do this shit." You know, yeah. if you have a uh, you know, a good head on your shoulders. And you're trying to make something honest, and, and and you're trying to make something that you like. There's no there's no ceiling, you know. I think you, anybody can do this shit. Yeah, because I I'm a high school dropout from a little podunk town in nowhere East Texas, man. Like, yeah, I didn't I you know I didn't really have a chance. Uh, I didn't have a, have a future. I thought at the time. But then songwriting, you know, there's tools there and you can use them, mm-hmm. you know, and anybody can do it. I think that's that's uh, my advice to you is that uh, if if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. You know, so consistency. Yeah. Well, Over I think it's just time. it's more like uh, just realizing that these people that are making these songs are normal people. Yeah. They're just yeah. reaching a little bit farther for into their minds and their their creativity. Well, to try to make these things and some people have deeper wells and they they write amazing songs like towns van zandt uh and some people write songs like fried chicken evil women make people <laughs> laugh but you know i read it along those same lines i was reading a book called the artist way by julia cameron and i'm gonna fucking butcher her quote but it's something along the lines of the lady was asking like do you know how long it's going to take me to become an expert piano player and her response was the same amount of time as if you don't you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. So like, yeah. kind of, and I, again, like I butchered her quote, I'm sure, but it's like I've it's, read that quote before. I know exactly what you what you're talking about. Yeah, man. Yeah, and so like, it, whether you put the time in or you don't, like you're still passing that time. You right. know? But and so that brings up the next thing. It's like to be able to do that consistently, day in day out, you got to have a pretty strong why behind what you're doing. You know, and so I'm a pretty I'm, strong why. Why? Like, why are you doing it? What is your purpose? Yeah. You know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? And so. I'm curious to know that because I searched for that for a long fucking time and I feel like I'm tapping into it a little bit, but like, I'm curious to know from other people, like, what is your why and how did you find it? Uh, my why is, uh, you know, as far as uh, music and all that shit, man, uh, my why is, um, I want to, I just want to make good music because I like I like writing songs and I like listening. It's it's just a, such a big part of my life. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just a music nerd who wants to make good music. If that you know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, personally, you know, within my life, I, I, I work and I do things that uh, are hard or, you know, things that are, are you know. I do I do the the uh, the bullshit to get through so I can support the people in my life that I care about, you know, and make, make the lives of the people around me better if I can. Yeah. I, that makes sense. But can you clarify, what do you mean by you do the, the hard stuff for the bullshit? Uh, like specifically? just driving for 10 hours straight to like to a gig, you know, or to go make a record. I got a blood clot in my leg from doing those two 10 hour stretches, you know, and I had a pulmonary embolism and I almost died. This was back uh, just in the middle of last year when we made this record. Uh, and, you know, that, just things like that. You yeah. Know? yeah. Almost dying just to go make a record. Yeah. But uh, we could have made it somewhere else with someone, uh, you know, uh, someone different. But we did, we did things that way because it was, uh, we couldn't pass up the opportunity. Yeah, you know. it's a good point that you bring up, right? Like, um, there's a quote by Neil Strauss. He says, "I've never met a strong person with an easy past." You know yeah. what I mean? So making those ten-hour drives and doing the things you're doing, it's just to me, it just builds layers of character. You know? Yeah. And so, so I'm sure, like, as you're you're gaining more success, you're getting more contacted by more people. Um, how do you de- how do you determine what to say yes to and then what to say no to? Oh man, you know, I think uh, you should trust your gut on things like that, you know. Uh, it, you, I mean, in the beginning, I think you should take any opportunity you get that comes mm-hmm. your way to play any show or to do anything, man. But I think at, at some point, like, 
my friend Charlie Crockett said, say yes until you can afford to say no. <laughs> you know, I think that's it's important to remember. Because uh, I played shows that I really didn't want to play for people that probably didn't like me, but I did it because it's a rule, man. It's never say no mm -hmm. to an opportunity. Unless it's going to hurt you in some way, you know. <clears throat> what do you mean hurt you? Like if, if you... If you're going to play a show that's too far away for too little money, you just can't make it work. See, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Or if you're you're going to play a show that you know is is not worth it, like bottom line. Yeah. Just don't hurt yourself trying yeah. to get to where you're going. Yeah. I got you. And that and the reason I'm asking that, like that comes up in my life. You know, I was a yes person for a long time, and and again, I agree with you. Early on, fucking say yes as much as you can, you know, and get as much exposure in whatever it is that you're doing, music or business or. Um, Whatever it is, I, I think that is savvy advice. Um, but I'm to the point now, it's like I, I feel like I, I was just saying yes to appease people, you know, to make people happy, to make people like me. And so now I'm practicing no a little bit more, you know. Um, you should know you should ask about that. It's Coulter Wall. I don't know if you already have, but he's good at saying no, I think. Did I? I think I, I don't know if I asked Coulter that. Yeah, I don't think I did. Well, he's turned down things left. I mean... Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. <laughs> I told Coulter I'd go on the Joe Rogan podcast with him if he wanted me to. Oh, really? He's the wingman. <laughs> What'd he say? He he thought I was joking. And I was joking, but he was like, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go and fuck shit up on the Joe... I want to go on there with him and just get really drunk and fuck the whole thing up. <laughs> like he did in Arkansas. Sure. Like I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you, man. So, yeah, so at what point did he, do you know, like, can you elaborate on that? Like, what point did he get good at saying no to certain things? I don't know. I, I really can't, couldn't tell you. Um, I got you. But I think, uh, I think he just had, he has a, uh, had a lot of things going on and a lot of opportunities flying at him at once. And I don't think you can say yes to everything at that point. Yeah. It's just physically yeah. impossible, you know? Yeah. But again, this is just me. That's my, I guess that's what happened. I don't know. Yeah, I got you. Well, you talked about trusting your gut, right? And I, I, um, I think that's important, like trust your intuition. How do you decipher like what is intuition trying to guide you down the right path? And then what is like that little voice of negative chatter? If you have that at all, it doesn't sound like you, you, you may have that, but like if you do, how do you decipher between the two? Between uh, like uh, intuition, intuition, and, and your and your gut telling you that, and then like a negative self chatter, like almost that I feel like humans have by default. You know, yeah, that either lead to resistance or fears in some way. You got to have faith sometimes, and 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 you got to trust the people around you. I mm. think that's important. You know, you got to trust the people in your life that are trying to help you. I like it. I struggle with that. Do you? Yeah, I struggle with that, man. Man, Pete, you know, <clears throat> life is is a crazy thing to go through. Uh, getting born is, you know, is something else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back to the songwriting for a minute. Like one of the songs you have it has a lyric in there, and it says, "Well, I'm as drunk as an uncle in a Walmart parking lot, blaring Margarita Bell, taking up two spots." <laughs> Dude, that shit is so funny to me, man. And I think the majority of people can relate to that. They know that guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was like the Walmart in Canton, Texas, to me, man. I just, just the imagery. Yeah. It's the best line I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. That that uh, that. So, how does that come about? Was that a guy you knew? Was that was my that? uncle? So it was. I just kind of, it's an amalgamation of different people that I've met in my life, you know? Yeah. But I think uh, I was just trying to follow the story in my head, and I came up with this character of somebody's uncle drunk in a Walmart, maybe like selling like a litter of puppies or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Got like an ice chest full of like shitty beer and just <laughs> hanging out. There for the it's day. something that a lot of city folks don't know about is back in the day, Used to chill in a Walmart parking lot, you know, like just go there and uh, hang out, tailgate for no reason. Yeah. That's small town shit, but you know. Taking up two spots. I mean, <laughs> nailed it, dude. Thanks, man. Um, 
so when did when did you realize like shit, man? I may be good enough to actually do this for a living. I never really never really thought about that. I think uh, I was things were happening for me, and you can't really think about you can't ask yourself too many questions like that because you start asking why, then other people are gonna wonder why too. Like, what the fuck are you doing here? You know. So you mm. gotta you just gotta keep rolling and. And just to keep your head down and, and stay working on whatever it is you're working on. But is that one of those things like act like anytime I go somewhere um, and I may not supposed to be there, but if I act like I'm supposed to be there, nobody really asks you any questions. Is that kind of the same sure, thing? Sure, man. Like when you I just was act like you're supposed to be there. Yeah, when I was like 19 years old and 20, going to play these bars and shit, I would walk in with my guitar case, and nobody would say shit or try to card me because I've got a guitar. I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. Yeah. But I fe- I had so many shows and, and, and social uh, gatherings or, s- or social situations where I felt like I really wasn't supposed to be there. And that's a shitty feeling, man. Why is that? Like an imposter syndrome in a way? I've heard... There's a fellow... Uh, uh, a guy that I know that, that always brings that up on Instagram anytime I talk about this kind of thing. And I love this guy for this because... Uh, yeah, imposter syndrome. I think that's a a crazy way to put it, like a kind of a harsh. I mm-hmm. think people really suffer from that, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a debil- debilitating, uh, you know, problem for them. But I think everybody deals with a little bit of that in their lives, you know. For sure. But uh, yeah, I've never, I, you know, it's not like crippling for me or anything, or it hasn't been. You know? Yeah. But yeah, there's been points. How did where, you get past that part, like? Where you said you walk in and you kind of feel that way, like you weren't supposed to be there. At some point, you just get kind of jaded, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, fuck these people, man. Like, I'm, I'm working too hard to worry about this shit, you know? Like, I've been here and I, I've done this, so it's it's useless. Yeah. It's useless to feel that way. Yeah. And it really does hinder you yeah. in the long run. Man, somebody told me a trick a long time ago, and it sounds, it sounds kind of woo-woo and, and maybe cliche in a way, but it works. And I think some of that may be the ego, like taking over when you walk in a room full of strangers and you're worried about what other people may be saying or feeling like you don't belong. But his advice to me was when you walk into a room full of strangers, like wish blessings upon everybody, like wish everybody the best in that room. Yeah. And it's fucking crazy, Vince. And like you can feel it. It's like you can flip the ego on itself when you walk in and you have that mindset. It's like this feeling of gratitude. Like you, it's like a superpower in a way. You know what I mean? All well, those negative pa- power things. Power of positivity, man. And, you yeah. know, because you you are everybody's brother or sister. You know. Uh, yeah. In this world, and I don't, I don't, you know, I try to. Uh, I'm nice to people until they give me a reason not to be. You know, <laughs> that's just how I operate. But yeah, there have been points in my life where I felt defensive or like I wanted to whoop somebody's ass just for looking at me sideways or something. You know, but yeah, man, I like I like the way you're thinking because. Uh, you you catch more flies with honey anyway. Yeah, as I say. Yeah, I agree. Um, so tell me about the new album. Do you have a name for it? So it's self-titled. Okay. And uh, yeah, thought about a couple different titles, but I figured this one was the one. I think uh, I just feel that way, man. I think a lot of songwriters like it's it's a a moment in their career when they put out their self-titled record. You know, it's important. Uh huh. For me, that's how I feel anyway. So when will it be out? Uh, I don't think we've told anybody the release date yet, but it will be uh, sometime in June. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. How many tracks we have on it? Ten. Ten of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. We've got some rapid fires. I go back and forth on this thing. People do the rapid fire thing on podcasts, so I feel obligated to do it. It's you know sometimes been. They're genuine questions, so I'm going to roll me. on. If you're good with it, I'm going to roll on with them. Sure. Um, we'll start with an easy one. Like, what is your, being in Fort Worth, what's your favorite place to eat in Fort Worth? Gus's. Where is fried that? Fried chicken. Gus's fried chicken. It's down off of uh, Magnolia Avenue. Can you find evil women there, too? If you look hard enough. There's a lot of bars around there. Okay, so, so yes. Sure. <laughs> um, give, me your, give me the best, like, Playing as many shows as you've had, I'm sure you've heard hecklers, or even just being at a show or seeing other people play. Like, what's the best heckler that you've ever heard? Probably the guy who spit on me. 
Where was that at? Yeah, that was in Fort Worth. That's got to be fun. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. There's been some really hilarious people that show up to these shows and they'll yell stuff and like... <clears throat> but I I can't remember all of them. But yeah, there's a dude that spit on me one time. And that was pretty memorable. You just wear it and keep playing? Yeah, you get it on my stage? shirt here. <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, he spit his gum at me or some something like that. He spit something at me, but just drunk and yeah. Well, I have my brother-in-law came to a show one time. I won't say his name. I won't say which one, but <laughs> he came to a show one time and he uh, decided he was gonna play my pedal steel player's guitar, and he reached over on stage and kind of it was like a smaller place, so you could walk up to the stage and he reached trying to touch the guitar or the pedal steel and. The bouncer looked over and was like, nope, you're done, dude. You got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt, I was like, oh, man, I love this guy to death. He's family. I can't I can't let him get kicked out. But I was <laughs> in the middle of playing a set. There wasn't much I could do about it. <laughs> and that's why it's hard to play hometown shows. <laughs> what are you scared of? Spiders. Spiders. <laughs> I'm scared of... Uh, Probably getting murdered. You are. Yeah. Like you think about it. I don't know. It's you know, if you're talking about fears, I think everybody's scared of getting getting stabbed in the chest or something crazy. But uh, yeah, that's a good segue. To my next one. Would Would you want to know when and how you're gonna die? Yeah, that'd be nice. But I think I would. Like the question is though for you, what would would you try to stop your own death? Ah, good question. Cause what if, what if you knew like you couldn't though? Like if you just knew that was how it was going to end, and then like there was nothing you could do. Like if somebody's coming at me with a knife and trying to stab me in the chest. Well, they would. I could if just if leave it was going to happen, right? they would get you from behind or something, you know. Yeah. Good, good follow up though. It's good. I didn't think about it. I didn't. I mean, I probably wouldn't want to know. Or maybe I would, you know. So I, then I could like. You know, get shit down. Get like, some shit in before. I got some shit. I got to move out of the backyard. I better get that done before I die next <laughs> week, man. Got to move this this washing machine that's been broken in my backyard for a month now. What's a song you wish you would have written? Thirteen silver dollars. Love it. It's a great song. Mr. Colter Wall. I wish. What's that? There's like, uh, it's all right, Ma, by Bob Dylan. I wish I would have written like a really long Bob Dylan song. Something really crazy with a lot of crazy metaphors and words. You listen to a lot of his music. I love Bob Dylan, yeah. But I think it'd be it'd be funny to have like a crazy, intricate, really deep song that goes on and on forever because I don't I write like three minute song two minute songs. Wish I could write crazy shit like that. Yeah. Have you tried though? No, just I don't have, I just don't have the time to you know. Yeah. Too busy, man. <laughs> I got shit to do. Um, what's the best investment that you've made in the last six months under a hundred dollars? Well, it was a gift, but my wife got me a uh, key finder, key like a key fob. It's oh. not even on my keys right now, but it's like this little charging station, and it has this little remote, and it has like it comes with like two or three key fobs, and you put it on your keys. And uh, anytime you lose your keys, you go and grab the remote and press either one or two for whichever key fob it is, and it'll start beeping. So you can go find your shit. <laughs> but then I lost the key. I lost the, the remote. So I wish you would have got me a, a second one. So I, could, <laughs> so I could. A finder for the finder? Yeah. But I, I feel like I'd end up with like a wall of this shit in my house. <laughs> it just wouldn't end. It's uh, awesome, man. Dude, I'm so bad. I lost my wallet for about a week just the other day, and I, I was taking out the trash, and I found it in the grass by the curb. Like, I don't know how it... I wasn't even over there. It had all your shit uh, in it? Yeah. All your cards and license? Yeah. What? I lose shit constantly. Here's one I like to ask, Benson. What is, uh, what is a book that you have either gifted to other people or that you've reread most? The Anarchist Cookbook. Really? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've read, man, I've read uh, Willie's autobiography a, a couple times now. Coulter recommended that, I believe. Did he? Is it, no, he recommended, uh, 
Willie Nelson. Is it the one about dirty jokes and like stories from the road and dirty jokes from Willie Nelson? Maybe. I feel like that's something he'd be into. That's. I think that's what he recommends. Kinky Friedman's got a really good book of like Texas isms. Okay. Like Texas sayings or like the guide to how to be a Texan, something like that. Uh, that's a pretty good one. Kinky Friedman. You should, by the on on the book subject, you should read Chinaberry Sidewalks. China. It's a Rodney Crowell uh, autobiography. I'll check it out. I read uh, along those same lines. I read Guy Clark's autobiography. Yeah, Billy Joe Shaver's got a great one too, man. You spent some time with him. I played a uh, pl- I played a show in Dallas with him one time, and we kind of became buddies. Yeah, Billy Joe was a good dude, man. It was really sad when he passed away just recently. When I first got into your music and started listening, like that was the first person that came to mind. I was like, this sounds a lot like Billy Joe. Shaver. That's cool, man. Yeah. I'll take yeah. that as a compliment for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so somebody comes in tomorrow and gives you $100 million or a monetary amount that you don't have to worry about money ever again. What do you do tomorrow? Taking a month off. <laughs> <laughs> Going to Cancun. No guitar, no nothing. Uh, man, I don't know. I'd probably pay some bills. Yeah? You know, probably uh, buy a couple guitars. But I mainly just try to pay off all my debt and then take it from there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Still playing music, though. I moved to Maui <laughs> and lived next door to Willie Nelson. Speaking of Maui, like, and, and it, I don't know, it just reminded me of Jason Momoa. Like, that was when I first saw you. I, actually, I was preparing for Coulter's interview, and I was like, who is this guy? I was like, the Roadrunner song. Oh, yeah. You, know, you played that, and I was like, that's fucking cool. Um, how, like, how has that been, like... Did that open some doors or like getting that exposure from that, that video alone? Um, how's that experience been? I think any, any time somebody with that fame kind of shares or that influence on people shares your music, it's a positive thing. You know, uh, I've had a lot of people, a lot of crazy Jason Momoa fans that have gotten on my Instagram and been like, Oh man, I'm going to get, I'm going to be friends with this guy so I can meet this guy or whatever. (laughs) So that's weird. But, (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's been nothing but positive for the most part. Yeah. Positivity with yeah. Jason Momoa. He's a positive guy. Seems like it. He is. I, on, honestly, I didn't know who he was. I had to ask my camera guys, who is Jason Momoa? Because I, I didn't know. Man, I walked but, in the green room and saw uh, him sitting there. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know who it was. And I was kind of walking around and I grabbed a beer and a shot of whiskey. And I was standing there and I felt somebody tugging on my shirt. And I turned around and this big dude... And a trucker hat, and I was like, this guy looks familiar, man. He's like, hey, man, how you doing? I'm Jason. I'm like, oh, I'm Vincent, man. Good to meet you. And I turned around and lit a cigarette and started walking out the room and got four or five steps out the door, and I I was like, wait, hold on. (laughs) And I turned back around to, like, somebody. I was like, is that that? Is that Jason Momoa? I was like, holy shit. And I went into my green room from Coulter's green room, and I turned to my guitar player, and I'm like, and I'm kind of known for telling like tall tales or just saying outlandish shit whenever at any point. But uh, I was like, Jason Momoa is in the next room. And my guitar player, Morris, was just sitting on the couch. He's like, oh, ha, ha, that's funny, man. <laughs> he got a, you know, it's pretty surprising. So you didn't know he was coming. Did Coulter, did Coulter know he was coming? I'm not sure. I don't know. I got you. I definitely had no clue what was going on, man. Yeah. <laughs> you're just like, hey, you want to play a song? He's such a good dude, though. The guy's so nice, man. Yeah. He's like a, you know, just a ball of just fun. I swear he drank like seven beers within a couple minutes because <laughs> I, I don't know what happened to all the beer all of a sudden. <laughs> well, walked in and just inhaled it. <laughs> just touched him and just through osmosis absorbed him at some point. I don't know. Had you did you just write the song Roadrunner at that time? Uh, I think I've been playing it. So I did like the first tour I did with Colt Wall, like a couple of runs with him. I came home and I was inspired by all that, and I, I wrote that song. And then by that point, it might have been the second or third run I was doing with Coulter. We were up in Canada, and uh, we were up in the green room, and somebody was like, "You should play play a song." I like, "Well, fuck yeah, sure, why not?" And we played that one, and, and his boys, uh, the Scary Prairie boys, were backing me up on that. Yeah. 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 I dug it, man. I loved it. Um, 
Favorite venue to play? I like Lukenbach, but I also really love Green Hall. So, kind of toss up between those two places. Two very good places. Yeah. What was your first vehicle? Oldsmobile Cutlass. Hell yeah. Yeah, it was burgundy. <laughs> yes. It was clean too. <laughs> you know? But it have like the I just I'm picturing like like the velvet ish like interior. So, yeah, it had like a whatever fabric that is, kind of like yeah, yeah, velvet. Yeah. It had that shit, yeah. <laughs> uh I ended up like when I came to Fort Worth, I was like living with this girl and she kicked me out and we were done and I had nowhere to go, so I ended up living in that thing. For through the winter, I think I don't know what year it was, but we had a crazy like ice storm come through here and freeze everybody in. So like I was sleeping in that shit, you know, for a good like month yeah. through winter time. Yeah, you know, that cloth will keep you warm, man. I sold it for like eight hundred dollars to make a record, not this record. I, I, I tried to make another record before, but yeah, sold it for studio time. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Who's an up and comer? that has caught your attention to look out for this guy named uh he's really good it's a canadian dude named colt the wall <laughs> maybe you've heard of him <laughs> uh, <clears throat> man i think there's a fellow named uh jesse daniel who's a good buddy of mine i think he's one of the best uh out there doing like sort of like a bakersfield country sound you know this girl named Riddy Armin from, uh, i believe she's from montana i've listened to a little bit of her yeah, stuff she's i really, really dig good. it man. um the local honeys. Yeah. You know, they're great. Uh, those are both LaHonda people. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, plug those guys a little bit. So LaHonda, you, Coulter, Rudy Orman. <clears throat> yeah, uh, that's all of us, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, for now. But I think LaHonda is going to continue to grow, you know. Yeah. Uh, so LaHonda was started by my manager and uh, a woman named Connie Collinsworth, mm -hmm. both from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh and they started the the label so we could put out uh, this record actually. So they started this record uh, record label, and uh, it turned into this thing where Coulter's like, "Hey, I want to, you know, I want to make a record on Londa too." And then all of a sudden, it's like, "Okay, cool, man, let's get the local honeys involved." Yeah. And then now they just signed a Ready Armin, so they're growing, man. Uh, they're doing good things, and they're good people too. Yeah. Seems like it. I've had a few brief interactions with Travis, and seems like a very good guy. And yeah, um, I look forward to you know what's to come from from La Honda and you guys. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And they're into so many so many different types of music. I could see them putting out like all kinds of different genres too, man. Really? Yeah, I dig it. Um, just a few more here for you. Um, if you could, in one word, describe what your new album is all about. <clears throat> uh, hardships, I guess. Hardships. Yeah. I'm curious. So, um, how is that? Like, so you put this. This is totally random, and my ADD kicking in. But like, you put this other album out, Evil Women, um, Fried Chicken, and Evil Women in 2019. COVID hits. You don't really get to promote it in 20. Yeah. And now you have a new one coming out. Like, are you still like going to try to push the old one? Along with the new one, now that the tours seem to be opening back up, how is that going to? Have you thought about that strategically? Yeah, I think uh, uh, you know, anytime an artist puts out a record and they do all right with it, and then they do something else that kind of looks like things are going to go up a little bit for them, their back catalog automatically comes up too. So yeah, yeah this record is going to be. It'll. I mean, it's my first official full length, you know, record. So mm -hmm. it's always going to be there. And I think, uh, you know, I hope I hope that it uh, continues to grow for sure, man. Even though I don't really, you know, I think some of the songwriting on it is is it's an honest attempt, but you know, I don't think it's the best in the world. But so interesting, man. I, 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 again, this is another quote that I'll butcher, but it's like we always look back and like almost not a judgmental way, but it's like tomorrow we're just yesterday's idiot. Right, so well, no matter if it's uh, two weeks or six months or two years, we're always going to look back and be like, "God, that was, that was juvenile, or that was so 
elementary, you know? But at the yeah. time, like, that's the best. And I'm not talking about your album at all. I fucking love it. I'm just saying, in general, human beings. Call me an idiot. <laughs> we'll always be able to look back. I, I'm my own worst critic. I do it all the time. And I guess that's what I'm saying is, for me, um, I shouldn't put words in other people's mouths. Like, for me, I always look back, and I'm like, God, that was so stupid. Like, I'm so smart yeah, now. Sure. Like, so I'm so much smarter now than I was then. We've all had moments like that, for sure, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, old, old saying, like, if I only knew uh, what I know now back then. Yeah. You know? Yeah. For sure, yeah. But sometimes you just, uh, you know, I think from an outside perspective, those things that you're doing, like, as far as when it comes to, like, putting out records, you may hate your first record, but someone from the outside looking in would be like, man... That record is great. They were at this point in their life. I like that a whole lot. I think that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we're we're hard on ourselves. I'm hard on myself when it comes to songwriting. I think you have to be though in order to grow, man. I Keep think going, uh, yeah. the day that you sit down and, and look yourself in the mirror and be like, I'm I'm a good songwriter. I just wrote like a great record. You know, I think you're done, dude. Because like, you can be like, oh man, this is pretty good. I like what I did, but. At some point, you gotta you gotta see like you gotta tell yourself like man, I think I can do better. Yeah, you know, so you top yourself. Yeah, I agree. And Coulter alluded to that too. He tries not to reflect too much on whatever success you know that he's had. And yeah, uh, and he's he's a young guy too, man. So you know, I made I'm, I wrote songs and made records. Tried to make records earlier on in my in my uh, songwriting life. And I'm glad that those things aren't on record, you know, personally. Like, I don't think yeah. that they're, I think they're garbage. I think everybody should have some time to warm up. You should write, a, I think everybody should write a couple records worth of songs before they put out an actual record, you know? Yeah. Corb Lund made a good point. Um, he said, the longer it takes for them to put a microphone in front of you, the more you have to say. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that made a lot of sense to me. Just as far as paying your dues or and then, and then again like that i apply that to and when, when i speak to musicians like they're talking about music music in, in uh, specifically but i think about it just in life in general you know paying your dues um before you actually have something to worth of value to say you know yeah i think uh that's that's a great way to go about things but uh sometimes like take like young bob dylan for example you know like it seemed like he came out of nowhere and was a young guy like 18, 19 years old, writing these crazy songs, these mm -hmm. really good songs. Like, sometimes people are just a little more in tune with certain things, like in the universe, I think. Yeah. Like guys like Bob Dylan or Towns Van Zant, who, you know, Towns, Towns was, I love Towns Van Zant to death, and I'm not talking bad about Towns Van Zant, but he came from a very wealthy family, and he kind of created a lot of the, of the problems that he went through in his life were, you know, uh, Self-inflicted, self for sure. And you know, sometimes people do that with the intent of trying to get something out of it. And sometimes it just happens to them because they got bad luck. But, you know, yeah, sometimes you just got to go through some shit. But yeah. you don't have to go through shit at the same time. Because it's all, it's all, uh, it's, it's art, you know. You don't have to be, you don't have to have been homeless or living in your car or like go through a bunch of crazy shit to write good or yeah. be strung out on drugs or anything, you know? That's interesting to hear you say that, you know, because most of the greats that you hear about have done one or all of those things yeah. you just mentioned. You I think know? nowadays people are wising up. You know, songwriters are wising up, and I hear, you know, you hear a lot of people saying exactly what I'm saying. It's kind of like, you know, don't do with those. And there's a lot of people that are doing that shit, doing bad things yeah. to themselves that uh you know that's that's just how people are but yeah i think if you yeah try to wise up you know if you can yeah i would question it i'm like fuck man towns like did it was like self-torture but he came out with some bad shit you know some badass stuff oh yeah dude and it's like yeah well like steve earl for instance i, I you know read whenever he got clean he was worried that he wasn't going to be able to ride anymore you know and then of course he still yeah. went on and, and and he's still steve earl you know right i think some of Towns Van Zant's best music was probably written when he was sober. I think. Totally. I mean, like, I don't think, I mean, uh, what's that one song? Uh, uh, 
what's that one tune by Towns? It's a line like, she lowed like a cow since I showed her how to lay her lily hand in mine. If I needed you. If I you. needed you. He wrote yeah, that he in wrote his that. fucking sleep, right? He was like on a bunch of robe tusks or something. He's like on a bunch of cough syrup because, you know, or what was it? Codeine, cough syrup, something like okay. that. And he wrote that song in his sleep. But that's just a story, though. I don't know if I believe that. I, I heard love... Guy Clark tell the story, so I, I don't know. It gave it a little bit of credibility. So the story is that Towns uh, fell asleep on all this cough syrup and then woke up in the middle of the night with this. He had been playing this song in his dream, and he wrote it down. And so Towns Van Zandt goes to bed. Guy Clark goes to bed. They wake up. Guy Clark walks in, and Towns wakes up and starts playing this song. Yeah. And uh, Guy's like, when did you write that? He's like, oh, I just wrote it down last night. That's a good story, but maybe <laughs> Towns wrote the shit like a week ago, a week <laughs> earlier or something. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. And I like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll bite with that. <laughs> I like the this, this story, you know, the yeah. mysticism of it all. I yeah. really like it, so. Yeah. But anyway, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think, I think towards the end, Towns Van Zandt would have made a lot of, a lot more great records if he didn't die of alcoholism, you know? I know, I was just thinking of that, like, uh, or I think about it often, like, what if that guy was still around, you know? Like, what could he have put out? Same thing with, like, Hank Williams, you know? He died early. Yeah, well, think but, about how many people that have hit their stride later on in their careers, you know? Mm-hmm. Or that have started writing a little later. Yeah. I can't name any right now, but uh, there have been folks that have done that, so yeah, there's there's got to be something to that as well. Yeah. Like you said, going back to, you know, uh, if you have a little bit, if you've been through more, you probably got more to say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And and that comes back to playing the long game, delaying gratification, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could collaborate with any artist, dead or alive, that you haven't, haven't already worked with, who would that be? I'd like to make a record with Steve Earle. Uh, I really, I'm a big fan of his stuff, but... That as far as living goes, I think uh, I really would have liked to uh, had the chance to go in the studio with Billy Joe Shaver. Mm. You know, I think uh, that might have been a possibility if I'd have kept. Uh, if you know, if he if he was around, and I would have been doing better. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Tell me this: Why? Why would you want? Why would you want to go in with Billy Joe Shaver? Specifically, uh, well, I think you know the obvious is because I'm a big fan of his songwriting. Yeah. But uh, you know, I think uh, I mean it would be crazy if I got to go in the studio with Billy Joe Shaver. You know, so I don't know. I'm just a big fan of his stuff, and he yeah. means a lot to me. So fair enough. Simple as that. Fair enough. Here's one I want to. I really want to know the answer to. Do you listen to vinyl? Yeah, yeah. Give me a good. What is a good record player? What is a good record player? Oh, I want to shit, buy I don't know. I've had the same one for, like, years now. It's old school. Uh, you know, they make these little cheap, cheaper record players that, uh, you know, that are, like, 50 bucks, 60 bucks. But yeah. as far as, I'm not, like, a big nerd about sound systems or record players or anything, so I couldn't tell you, man. I got you. So that answer is a dud. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, dude. But I have been looking. I do want to I do want to get one. Um, last question for you, and then I'm going to get you to play one for us if you'd be so kind um if you could have a billboard anywhere hypothetically speaking to get a message out to millions of people what would that message say uh it'd have to be don't look at this billboard (laughs) because i think it's a big distraction man like see those like digital billboards that change all the time (laughs) yeah yeah, what have you seen like the most ironic ones to me are the ones that like don't text and drive and there's a whole bunch of like little small text down at the bottom and shit. Like, come on, man. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm looking up at this crazy billboard trying to read a paragraph <laughs> telling me not to text. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think I'd probably try to put up some sort of positive message, but you know. It could be a quote, it could be a lyric, it could be something you've heard. Um, it, it, the idea has, has escaped me at this moment, but you know, I'm sure I'd try to put something positive up there, or try to put up a, a picture of myself holding my record and like buy my record. <laughs> there you, know, you go, man. I got bills to pay too. You know. <laughs> I love it, man. <laughs> 
All right, um, before you before you go, man, um, I'd like to first thank Schaefer Outfitter for having us today. These guys um, have been great, you know, for letting us come in here and set up. And uh, glad to have them as friends of the show. Um, where can people find out more about Vincent Neil Emerson? VincentNeilEmerson.com. Um, and uh, just Google me. Just Google Vincent Neil Emerson. You'll find something about me. You'll be in all the places. VincentNeilEmerson.com, LaHondaRecords.com. Instagram and I'm tour dates. So you're going to be in Fort Worth tomorrow night playing, right? Yeah, I'm playing at uh this place called uh, Tulips. It's a new venue here in Fort Worth. I don't know why I'm trying to promote that because this is going to air in three weeks and nobody's going to For the go, time but... travelers out there. <laughs> <laughs> but com coming up, I know you're going to be in Oklahoma and, and a few other places. So um, go, definitely go check out his website. If you don't know Vincent L. Emerson, um, I, I, I uh, as a recent fan, um, am glad that I have found his music. Um, I highly recommend go check him out. And uh, I'm going to shut up now and let you go play one. Cool, man. This dude is a blind guy who plays a guitar like this. Yeah. Like, uh, he, dude, this, it was incredible. But he, uh, at one point, I was like, how's that rhythm part sound? Is my rhythm, all, you know, on time, you know, is everything good? Just kind of checking. And he was like, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> but he's like t so much better than me, man. So you know, whatever. <laughs> this guitar thing is just a gimmick to get this this songwriting out, you know. Mm-hmm. Not a gimmick, but it's just a. a Will you write first, or do you do you come up with the the chords first and then put words to it? Hanging out down a shaker. With my boy, Converse Cowboy. What you gonna do, boy? <laughs> Something like that, you know? Yeah, fuck yeah. Just cut, just start. I like to play chords and then come up with a melody and then kind of just everything kind of comes together as it's happening. Define for me. Define melody. Melody, it's like, you know, ah, 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 up and down, notes. Yeah. What do you mean? I don't know. I asked that question because like, I try to Google it and it doesn't make sense to me. Like, I can't figure out what exactly is melody. What, what does that mean? So that's one melody. It's just the, the pattern of the notes. Is it the hook though? Is it like the hook or like the, the it really part is of the just, song? It's just like the, the... So you have these chords laid down and you can s improvise sort of like a, a guitar player would over chords, you know? So like... So you just play melodies over the chord structure. You can do the same thing with your vocals, so... Right on. But don't ask me, you know, I'm not an expert on it or anything. <laughs> I'll stop asking questions and let you get to it. <laughs> Fifteen dollars is my game, fifteen is my draw. Lord Randall Collins is my name in the state of Arkansas. Rolling dice in the rail yard won't get you too much, Jack. Well, working on that section game will surely break your back. Fifteen dollars is my game, fifteen is my draw. Lord Randall Collins is my name in the state of Arkansas. Hiding out by the water tank Where the shade is cool There's watching that straw boss hunt for me I ain't nobody's fool Fifteen dollars is my game Fifteen is my draw Lord Randall Collins is my name In the state of Arkansas Train in the Memphis yard, 
long list I ever saw. Well, I ride it down to Fairbanks town, down in Arkansas. Fifteen dollars is my game, fifteen is my draw. Lord Randall Collins is my name in the state of Arkansas. With fifteen dollars is my game, fifteen is my draw. Lord Randall Collins is my name in the state of Arkansas. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. There it is. <laughs> so how is Coulter's version different though? Is it like uh like he switches he the verses like, up? Fifteen dollars is <laughs> fifteen is my draw. <laughs> Randall Collins is my name. I am Coulter Wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the new one? What's the what's the new one called? I don't know. Let me look at my track list real quick and see which one I'm gonna do. Will you title a song uh, before you write it, or do you title them after? I've tried to title before, just because something sounds cool, but they always end up kind of goofy, you know. Yeah. So I usually title the song afterwards. I really like how John Prine does it because at one point he tried to title the songs before, like after he was done writing it and put it on the record. But I think uh, at one point he was like, it was, I think it's like Spanish Pipe Dream. He was playing it live and somebody was like, play that song about a, you know, hap, was it Happy Enchilada? Oh, that, Happy yeah, that's a. Or play that song, Blow Up Your TV, is, is a line that everybody says. And he's like, I should have just titled it Blow Up Your TV. You know, cause <laughs> that's what everybody says, so. Well, the world is on its head. And I thank my lucky stars that I ain't dead. I spent my whole life in the red And I done my best to keep my family fed So when I lay my burdens down Keep my debts out of your mind just for a while All my troubles and my trials They lay scattered on the trail for miles and miles I've been paying my whole life Trying hard to find the blame for all my strife I've been burning through my check And I never felt their gold around my neck Oh, but their gold, it don't shine It's bright as one out steel rail on the line and if you ride it, you might find That the faces on your change will change with time I was a victim of the charge I Made and spent my pay in honky-tonks and bars But good times don't pay the bills And a belly by itself does not fill So I keep saving up my pay Waiting on a new one cloudy day Watch all the hard times drift away And I'll no longer be tainted to their dismay Well, the world is only its head And I thank my lucky stars that I ain't dead I spent my whole life in the red Done my best to keep my family fed. So 
when I lay my burdens down Keep my debts out of your mind just for a while All my troubles and my trials They lay scattered on the trail for miles and miles All my troubles and my trials They lay scattered on the trail for miles and miles Thank you, man. Love it. Thank you, brother. Yeah, man. Thank you for playing. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for playing. <clears throat> well, man, um, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for playing. I've, uh, I've enjoyed having you. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, it really has been a, a, a good experience, dude. Yeah, you I bet. Think you're, I think you're doing a, a, a cool thing with, uh, with your show. You know? Thank you, my and friend. I think it's important to ask, ask people these questions. And for people to hear the answers to those questions, maybe not this interview or this show for me, that's up to whoever's watching, but I appreciate you, brother. No, yes, sir. And, and, and I, again, thank you for coming on. And I learned something from every interview that I do, and I know the listeners do too. Um, um, I would also like to thank my friends here at Schaefer Outfitter for having us. It's always a pleasure to be back in Fort, Fort Worth and especially down here in the stockyards and with these guys over here at Schaefer. So um, until next time, guys, stay grateful. And remember, the journey is the destination.